Today we're gonna to do some product photography. Top down, overhead, whatever you wanna call it. Obviously you see the camera is right here and we're gonna shoot straight down. What we're working with is whisk takers. You guys may know, you may have seen this. We're gonna do some photographs of the layout of the ingredients here. This is the type of photography that you can do with your own product. Um, you can do this with your own food at home. You can do anything like that that you wanna do. I'm gonna show everybody two different lighting setups today. We're gonna use natural light, that's why we're standing by this incredibly bright window. And then I'm gonna do an artificial light setup afterwards. The natural light setup that we're gonna go through first is definitely a little bit more beginner friendly. Um, that's not to say that it's not gonna look excellent because if you can use natural light well, you can achieve really great effect. I still always say that there's nothing really gonna beat a good window. Right, this is totally simple stuff, we just wanna take this light from the window. We are gonna diffuse it with something to soften it up. We don't want hard shadows on the product. And then we are gonna bounce in to fill on the other side because the particular look that I wanna go for here today is uh, definitely a little bit more light and airy and pleasant. If you don't have this kind of a curtain set up, you can easily go to the store and for like really three or four dollars, you can get yourself a shower curtain, like a white diffused shower curtain. You have to make sure it's white. You don't want any color cast. You hang it in front of any window doesn't really matter. You get nice, beautiful window light, and it's just, it's it looks great. Now, this is an actual reflector. I got this from Amazon. It's like newer, like like a really affordable, like sort of Chinese knockoff brand. Uh, it's, you know, I don't hate on it. You can get the same kind of reflector. It's like 20, 30 bucks, really super affordable. But if you don't even want to spend that much, anything white is going to work just fine. The benefit of this is that it has a few more options. You can do like a gold, a silver. It's a little bit more versatile, so that's cool. Um, but even just like a piece of white foam core will absolutely do the trick here. I have some black fill that we can use a little bit after. I'll show you again with the natural light to get like a different sort of aesthetic and a different vibe. Uh, but we're not going to go like all in on a hundred different looks. Basically, I just want to show you the way we can get this one look with a few different light setups, and we're going to start with the accessible window light because pretty much everybody's got windows. Um, so the camera is overhead, right? We are here. I have this boomed out, um, but I'm going to be honest with you. If you're just using a window and a reflector, you can actually pull this off with a phone, like a basic cell phone photo. It's not going to look as good in my opinion, but if you're just doing something like for social media and you just need it real quick and dirty, no big deal. You want to make sure your camera is level. If you decide later on that you want to rotate or change the orientation of the image that you worked with, even if you're not perfectly level and you have access to some, some post-production software, something like Photoshop, Lightroom, Capture One, all these programs give you options to sort of adjust the angle, like distortion, you know, which is not too difficult to do because it's just sort of one point of view. You know, everything's just one lens. It's not like seeing with your eyes. So camera is here. Uh, we, are shooting, we are shooting tethered. So I have this little cable dangling around and that is running into the computer, which you can't see right now because I have it behind the reflector. Uh, it might be too dark, sorry. Uh, but the computer's over here, right? So I'm shooting tethered into the computer because I don't want to be fiddling with the camera. Uh, I just want to have it set up where I want it. And then I want to pay attention to what I'm doing on the table. And this way I shoot into, uh, shoot into the computer. It's also important because you don't want to necessarily trust that you're always getting the right exposure because of what you see on the back of the camera. So I really like to be able to check my histogram and see like the actual exposure and luminance values of what I'm working with. It's important for me to have that consistency in what I'm producing because if I'm doing some work like this and there's high volume, I know that I need everything to sort of fall into the same same type of same type of value. So when I go to process everything, I can do a batch process and I can apply edits to the whole thing, and I don't have to go through it individually um, because often this type of work is is going to be is going to be predicated on high volume. So we're actually shooting tethered into Capture One, which is now my my primary photo editor and digital asset manager. Uh, I really love this software, it's really good stuff, um, I think I think it's top notch. Um, one of the things I like about it is typically uh, what I will do is at the beginning of my session I'll sort of get the look that I want straightened out and like sort of get it dialed in and then I'll save those settings as like a little preset in that particular session that I'm working and the, the software will apply those settings as, as I work through the set and it'll apply to each individual photo so later like when it comes time to edit and like I'm done I might not even need to do anything at all. Anywhere you can save time, especially if what you're doing is a repetitive task over and over, um, saving a few minutes here or there in the long run will, will definitely pan out and be beneficial, right? Wherever you can save time is good. In the meantime, I will definitely throw some photos up on the screen so you can see what we're getting and what we're working with. It's pretty much what we got going on and let's, uh, let's get started here. All right, so like I said before, I've got the window here just to my right side and I've got a reflector here to my left side. 
So what I'm going to do in order to get started is I'm going to take this reflector and I'm going to pull it back a little. I don't want to accidentally get in the shot. I'm going to lean it in like this. I'm going back here. I'm going to take a shot. Here it is. What we're going to do now is do a little evaluation. We're going to look at stuff. You can see these whites are coming in very bright. And I don't want that. We're going to adjust some settings on the camera. One of the cool things about Capture One is that I can just I can I don't have to touch the camera. Since everything is is connected, I can I can get in there and I can just do it totally manual. Having that full control is like really great. Um, I like to be able to do things from the computer. Awesome way to go. So let's take another shot now that we've adjusted the settings. So things are starting to look good. I like where we're at exposure wise. You see what's going on with the whites. They're not too bright, and that's that's good. I don't want to overexpose. That's that I'm protecting those highlights, uh, especially like right now, like this is real bright. A lot of this product here is actually white. So that's all very reflective. Once you blow out highlights, you can't recover them. You have a little bit more leeway with shadows. Now I am of course shooting raw, so I have more option to pull up that exposure. Uh, but always important to remember that it's much easier to recover your shadow information than it is to recover your highlight information. So, so I always tend to be a little bit more precious about the highlights. Like that's really the area where I keep an eye on and I worry the most about protecting. So um, this looks pretty good. I like the exposure where we're at now. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rearrange this and we're gonna do a few different shots and a few different angles. And we're gonna just, we're gonna proceed and see how everything feels and we'll, uh, we'll just go from there. So I really like the look of this. Let's shoot this a little bit here. Let's get that reflector in like we talked about. All right, we're gonna just double check on our whites. That's, like I said, very important. Now, what I really wanna show here with this particular product is that this is a baking kit. Um, there's steps involved, so we have, we have directions, we have the various ingredients sort of laid out, and this is like what comes with the kit. It's nothing super complicated. I just wanna be mindful of what exactly the product is that I'm handling, and that's all there really is to it. I have those two looks that we just did. I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna try to rearrange things, I'm gonna get another, like a third look, and maybe a fourth, and I might call that good with this box. And what I'll do is I'll tag everything up, so I remember later when I go to organize what everything is. You can actively be doing file renaming and color rating things and number rating things and output into different folders, which is not all that different from any other software that you might use for this kind of a process, but for me this one's very user friendly, and I really like the options with it, and I really find it to be a very powerful raw processing software so and it does still play well with Photoshop so I can easily send photos out of here once I have them edited and create like a TIFF and I'll send them into Photoshop for editing I always like to edit the TIFF because PSD is Adobe proprietary and I'll be honest I don't even know if this program will put out a PSD and I don't care because I'm never gonna use PSD for anything much rather use TIFF it's much more accessible to another a wider variety of programs it's a little bit more future-proof it's a little bit more versatile. If I decide I don't want to be using Adobe in a few years and all my files are locked in Adobe file formats, then I'm in trouble. All right, so we're gonna arrange it again, do something different. All right, we got our third look. We'll bring in the reflector like we've been doing, nothing crazy. And we're gonna see where we're at with our whites. Cool, that's kind of like the main thing. I just want to make sure where it's at and how everything looks. So we're gonna change this up a little bit because I want to show that these are all Ziploc bags. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't feel like that was necessarily clear in the last image. All right, cool. Now I think that might go a little wide of the frame, so we're gonna zoom out just a touch. And get in there with the reflector again. All right, things are looking good here. I got a few different aesthetics, a few different looks on this. I have to say another thing, obviously, to be mindful of when you're shooting with window light is you're not always gonna have it. You only have it during the daytime hours, and it's gonna be different, and it's gonna change. So since the sun is moving across the sky, obviously you need to monitor your exposure and you need to be constantly changing and adjusting things. There's another issue with natural light. It's very beautiful, and it's. but again, if you're doing high volume and you need to maintain consistency to save yourself time in your post-processing and your delivery to your clients and stuff like that, maybe the better way is to invest in some strobes. Now, obviously if you're investing in some strobes, your, your price range is all over the place, and we'll talk more about that, but anybody can do this. Just white paper, white board, you can go buy a reflector if you want to buy a reflector. Nice window, nice diffusion, and that's pretty much all it takes. You know, any kind of camera that you want to use. Again, the phone works, it all works. I'll be honest, this also, if I were to put a backdrop on this side over here, sort of block blocking the video camera, then I could also take the camera off and I could shoot this at an angle and I could do the same thing. I would still use the reflector and I would still use the window light and I would still get like this nice filled in beautiful effect. Before I forget, I wanna show you guys how to get a little bit of a different look, something a little bit more dramatic. So we're gonna take this reflector out of here actually. It's gonna go.
And now over here I have I have a black card. Um, this is this is just a piece of black this black foam core that I got from Staples for a couple bucks. Um, it's probably a little small for this layout, but just to sort of show you how things can look a little bit different when you change things. So instead of a reflector, what we'll do is we will take this on the other side. Let me make sure we're not getting another shot though. And uh, we're gonna shoot that. Now, this is not really the look I want here today with this particular setup, but maybe you're photographing something different. You wanna be a little bit more moody. Uh, you wanna cut a little bit of light. So it never hurts to give yourself options and maybe you wanna have like a little bit more dramatic shadow thing going on. And you can easily do that just like this with the black card. And that's how you do it. Maybe you have a different color tabletop, a different color wood. Um, oh, by the way, this little wood that you're seeing, I just bought this at Hobby Lobby, a couple bucks. You can totally achieve a beginner setup here, no problem. All right, I've gotten everything from the natural light setup all kind of put away, and I've brought out the strobe and the artificial light setup that we're gonna use for the rest of this video. Today we're using a one light setup, again with a reflector, but we're just gonna use one light. You could easily do this with two lights, three lights, any number of lights, whatever works for you. I find that since we're working on a table with a relatively small amount of product, one light is really more than enough for this kind of a thing. It's really just one small box full of items. It's not really a lot to deal with, so I don't need to bring a lot of lights into the situation. What I've done is I've set up this, I think this is a, I wanna say this is a, like a 30 by 40, 20 by 40. You know, I'm not sure how big this thing is. This is a Paul Buff soft box. I don't know exactly the size, but it's pretty large. I'm gonna say at least 40 inches on the long edge. And I have that, I have swapped out the buff mount because I'm no longer using Paul Buff lights, but I do like this soft box. I feel like it's good construction. I'm no longer using any Paul C. Buff lighting. I've sort of moved away from it. Nothing against the Paul C. Buff lighting. It just doesn't really suit my needs anymore. What I'm using predominantly is a set of flashpoint lights. Uh, I like them. I find them to be re like really affordable and give relatively consistent results. For the price point, they put out a decent amount of power and they meet my needs. The exposure variation with these lights certainly exists and it's somewhat noticeable. Uh, definitely more so with something like this and it makes it for a little bit more time in the workflow and maybe in the future I'll, I'll look to invest in something that's a little bit better so I can have that consistency. For now though, this is definitely good enough because you're not talking about a major variation from shot to shot, maybe like maybe in the neighborhood of a third of a stop. So it's not crazy uh, and I can I can fairly easily compensate for it. What I've done on my software is I've hotkeyed the exposure to the plus and minus icon. So as I go through and I need to bring things even, it's just a quick tap of a button. Obviously, I said earlier that it's important to sort of minimize your time. And again, this is one of those situations where you have to sort of ask yourself, is it worth the time to correct the exposure or is it worth the money to buy the better lighting? And I do hope at some point in the future to have stuff that's more consistent and more more professional, but for now, this is really getting the job done. We've got the AD600 in a big soft box, pretty sizable, as you can see. I have it sideways to sort of cover as much as I can, like get as wide of a spread as I possibly can. This would work still if you're using like an Octabox. Realistically, this would work with with most modifiers, especially because of the setup that we're doing today. I'm not I'm not looking for a really tight or controlled lighting situation. I want to sort of just get everything nice and bright. If I wanted to have some more contrast in these photos, make things a little bit darker, a little bit moodier, uh, first I would probably use a different type of wood, a different set I would bring this out of here I would probably put a grid on the soft box and then I would bring in the black fill card that you saw earlier and that would allow me to sort of narrow the light what we're doing and uh, you know and then really bring like like bring some depth to those shadows really make those shadows nice and dark which is a look that I personally like and maybe in a future video if you're interested I can do a more moody setup I can do a whole different one so we're gonna get started on this setup uh, first I have to lay out the items though All right, we've got everything laid out and we're ready to get started on our photography. Something I should have pointed out earlier is you wanna be mindful of sort of your working area, right? Now, since I'm using these boards here, I kind of can just judge like where my frame is based on these seams. It's nothing crazy complicated. If I was using a flat surface with no lines on it already, uh, I might put a couple of pieces of tape. This is just so I have a sort of consistent idea. Again, really a lot of what I'm doing here is trying to work towards being more efficient. So we're gonna bring in the reflector just like we did before. Let's take a shot. All right, I feel like that's looking pretty good. I'm really happy with this, actually. I'm seeing that my whites are not blown out. I'm maintaining those highlights, same thing as I was doing before. I've got like a very low contrast kind of look here. 
there's enough going on as far as texture and color and between the wood and the ingredients on this table here that I'm not worried too much that the contrast is not super high, right? I don't have a lot of strong shadows here. Um, and I keep bringing it up because if you know me and you've seen my work, you know that I like to work with a lot of dark and strong shadows, right? That high contrast aesthetic is a big part of what I do. It's important to maintain flexibility though. Different clients are gonna have different needs and you can't always do the same thing. Now, I wanna be able to provide a wide range of different aesthetics and different looks to sort of meet the needs of the situation as it comes up because not every setup and not every situation calls for the same kind of dark and moody dramatic photography right this is a baking kit we're looking at these are delicious ingredients and we're gonna make delicious brownies I don't know that I want to have that be like really moody and dramatic I want to just show what we have I want to show the product so that's been my focus let's talk camera settings I didn't talk much about the settings on the daylight photos because basically depending on the time of day the angle of the sun how big your window is where your window is what kind of diffusion you've put on it if you've put diffusion on it there's a hundred different factors that determine what time of exposure you need to get now even though i can show you what camera settings i used today for that lighting that doesn't really help you if you're also going to be using natural lighting because it's variable it changes all the time so you really just have to get a feel for it you have to get a, you have to get an idea of what you're looking for and again that's why i like to be shooting everything tethered because i know where i want to be at uh, i'm not going to use a light meter i've never used a light meter i think it's kind of outdated technology i can't imagine why i would use a light meter when i can see a full readout of the entire image right here on the screen i can look at the levels i can look at the histogram i can bring up scopes i can do a hundred different things to see what's going on with this image so that's important that you sort of get an idea of how your camera works and how your lighting works. That way you can provide consistent things to your own style and to your own taste and whatever it is that you want to create. I have a pretty good idea of what I'm going to get from the window today when I set up to do it, but tomorrow would be a different day. Like if we wanted to do this on another day and say it was cloudy, I would have to use a whole different set of settings. The benefit to working in a studio setup and having lighting control, you can use similar camera settings and a similar light setup and similar power output pretty much all the time if you want to. Most of the studio work that I do on my camera camera is shot at the following settings. A shutter speed of 200th of a second to sort of reduce the ambient light. I use an aperture between f8 and f12. Sometimes I go outside of that range. More or less I want to stick in there because I want I want that sharpness from that center range of the aperture on the lens. You have to find the sweet spot on your own lens. I find mine is in there and most of them are in that mid range. That's typically where they fall. So I want that sharpness. That's important to me. So I like to shoot in that area. I usually try to keep my ISO as low as I possibly can. Typically between one and 400, depending as the situation calls. Most of the time, if I'm using the AD600, I'm usually, I'm using it about one eighth power. This is all variable. This is all subject to change, depending on what you're shooting, what you're doing, what you need. You know, if you're using multiple lights or if you're using just one light. Generally, if you look at my my photography you'll see that most of the studio work falls in that range of camera settings and that's that's because I was what I want I'm using the light at 1 8th power because I don't want to stress the light too much I find that I would rather turn up the sensitivity on the ISO a little bit before I would turn up the light that's just my personal preference everybody's a little bit different I think that I can still get very clean images even at ISO 400 it's not a problem I don't really introduce any noise on these full frame cameras they're quality pieces of equipment so it's not a thing that I really worry about it's definitely important for me that I have a deep depth of field not so much today because everything is pretty much just laying flat here and there's not that much space between the front and the back for things to sort of focus on. But if I'm doing a person or something like that or something stand up and there's a background, I like to have that deep depth of field. For me, the sharpness is, is important. That's just part of my, my whole thing and I'm just, that's what I like the most. Now I'm going to go ahead and do what I did earlier and rearrange these and do a few different setups. Um, I'm not going to change the lighting that much. I'm not going to change the aesthetic that much. It's just going to be different arrangements of the items on the table. So I'm probably going to cut the video now. But if you're watching, let me know what you thought. Let me know if you want me to do other sort of talk through tutorial kind of things. Let me know if this was helpful. Let me know if I, I left anything out. Yeah, just comment below and thanks for watching.